And that's when people really grasped it, you know, this idea that there was this thing that we could call something that, that, was, that was indicative of what we could see in the world that we could use to excuse all sorts of things we couldn't predict. By the late 60s and 70s, the optimism of the 50s was in retreat. Once again, the man-made world spun out of control. There was social, political and economic turmoil from Paris to Detroit. And while ordinary people were shocked by the events, what was shocking for the experts was their failure to predict them. And so it was a terrible shock when it didn't. It was really very hard for them to take. People thought they'd understood it, and it turned out not to be true. In the late 60s, and increasingly we moved into the 1970s, all these laws broke down really quite spectacularly. Because they weren't laws, they were simply statistical relationships which happened to hold for a relatively short period of time. Economists had thought they had understood the laws that governed how the economy worked and thought this then gave them the power to predict what would happen. And what's clear is that forecasts only work when, in a sense, almost anybody could make a good forecast, when the economy is state, when it's going along very nicely. Anybody can make a reasonable projection then and be reasonably correct. What forecasts are very bad at, when you precisely need them, when there's a major turnaround, when there's a recession, and the track record on forecasting recessions is really appalling, it's essentially non-existent. The turbulence of the 1970s convinced the economists as well as the environmentalists that their faith in large-scale prediction and control was just wrong. They came to accept they would no more be able to control the economy than they could the weather. The era of command and control was over. But there was a second, more controversial part of the mathematics upon which they fundamentally disagreed. Ruel and others had found that even very simple systems, such as pendulums driven by a motor, or double pendulums, where two are connected together, could give rise to highly complex chaotic behavior. And now, as they used these simple systems to explore further, they began to discover the rules of this chaotic world. They found that the more connected and interlinked systems became, the more likely they were to become chaotic and turbulent. And that the more you pumped the system, the faster you ran it, the more chaotic it would become. And yet in the real world, this is exactly what began to happen. On October the 27th, 1986, computers connected the world's financial systems together into a single global economy. And the modern free market was born. There was a lack of confidence more in, in planning. That's what came, came about, the idea that you could discover these relationships. And quite rightly, a lot of skepticism crept in from policymakers. And the idea that we could somehow quantify this. So in a sense, we then went back to first principles and said, well, if we leave it to markets, you know, markets will, in a sense, you know, solve the problem. Um, and we needn't be as interventionist. At the same time the computer was allowing us to understand this interconnected world, it was also building it and driving it faster and faster. And so there was a feeling just empirically that the idea of leaving it to the market was very soundly based. But it wasn't just justified in equilibrium theory, uh, but markets clearly were delivering, and they did, dramatic results in terms of prosperity, increases in lifespan. This is the point where the environmentalists and the economists start to diverge from each other. Because for the economists, it's all about bigger, faster, global. They'd learned the lesson that the economy was not something they could just control. Instead, they started to see it as a kind of natural system that you absolutely must not regulate, which fed right into the new free market ideology, which declared you cannot buck the market. The global financial economy began to grow as never before. But as it did, so did its unpredictability. From the point of view of stability, control, predictability, it is a bad idea to drive a system to its limit, to uh, warm up the atmosphere, uh, to 
make more, to put more complication in the economy. I think the issue of growth is obviously it's, it's at the heart of economics, but it's also at the heart of the climate problem. The more you uh, mess up with a nonlinear system, the more likely it's to become chaotic. The records of the meteorologist give cause for concern. At the moment, we have economics. Forget about the environment. We dump stuff in the environment. We use it. We have envir environmental change and climate change, which is like driven by humans, but doesn't react back on them. That's quite at odds with really the way the world operates, which is that eventually your economic growth could be stopped by the impact you have on the environment, because the environment is the source of our wealth. Ignoring the warnings of the new maths, we instead stoked the system for all we were worth. The free market economists assured us their model said we could simply leave the markets to their own devices and they would magically find their natural equilibrium. The empirical models that economists use to make forecasts of the economy, which the general public relate to, in a sense these are throwbacks, these are dinosaurs to the models of the 60s when they appeared to work. They're still searching, even now, if you like, for empirical regularities, which they believe will enable them to make successful predictions of the economy. You know, one little tweet, one little clever bit, we can really discover what this law actually is. And the forecasts still rely ultimately on that same approach. Uh, and it doesn't work now, and it never will do. We live in a world that is increasingly uh, going away from uh, anything like an equilibrium or a steady state. I mean, you want now to have growth, 2%, 3% more, and this means uh, exponential growth, something that we know cannot last forever. If something grows exponentially, it must break down at some point. That is something that can be predicted with safety. The process must end somewhere. How it will end, I don't know. Our leaders tell you that we need uh, two or three percent uh, growth per year, and uh, this is necessary for the well-being. Of course, uh, it may be necessary, but it cannot be maintained forever. Exponential growth is basically a, a linear thing, and uh, uh, the claim is that non-linearities will put a stop to this uh, exponential growth. That is for sure. For over a century now, we have not wanted to hear that the promises of prediction and control might be bankrupt. Not even wanting to admit the evidence of our own eyes. This is the Detroit Public Schools Book Depository, where the promises to the next generation were stored. This is what has happened to it. Trees growing out of the rotting remains of yesterday's dreams. All life is interrelated. We are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality, tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. As long as there is poverty in this world, no man can be totally rich even if he has a billion dollars. Martin Luther King, 1961, the American.